Well, good evening and uh, welcome to week two of ACT TV. We've had such a positive response. We decided that the show wouldn't be culled after its first week. In fact, it's even been featured on One News. So you can say that you're watching ACT TV as seen on TV. I hope everybody is well uh, in their bubbles and looking forward to a little bit of freedom that's not too far away south of Auckland and a little bit further off in Northland. Um, and for all my fellow Aucklanders, it seems that this short, sharp lockdown uh, is going into another two weeks for four weeks in total and counting. We've talked a lot about some of the things we believe the government woulda, coulda, shoulda done in order to be better prepared for that. Uh, and But for now, all we can say is that we feel for people who are stuck uh, trying to work uh, with their kids, people who are in construction in particular where uh, time is money and you need a cycle of progress and payments in order to keep the cash flow going. I know there'll be people under huge pressure who are across a whole lot of businesses that can't operate or can't operate profitably under these conditions. There's a few things that the government could be doing and they're mainly around transparency. We've had an extraordinary day of different stories about vaccination. We heard on Sunday from the Ministry of Health they had about 460,000 doses. Uh, since then, they've got another 320 in. Well, that gives you about 780. But they've also reported that they vaccinated about 620,000 people. If you're following, that should take them down to 160. Uh, and yet somehow the Prime Minister is telling us that really uh, they've got 840,000. It's almost as though they're just making the numbers up, although we are hearing reports of shortages. It would be helpful if the government could just tell us how many vaccines they really have and if the numbers were reconciled and consistent. I suspect there's a shortage, and the reason is that on Heather Duplessy Allen. Uh, drive News Talk ZB this afternoon. There were incredible revelations, really, uh, going back a few months that Chris Hipkins actually asked Pfizer to delay their deliveries. They were going to deliver them by the end of September, but now they've uh, been asked, actually asked to do it later, come back in October and November. Well worth checking out News Talk ZB for that story, but not before watching Act TV, of course. Um, the fact that we have this delay is one of the reasons that we're in our current status. We know that it's really difficult. We know that it's not easy to fight Delta, but it would be a lot easier if we felt that the government was treating us like adults, taking us into the confidence of their planning so we can have some ownership of the plan too. The other area is around the cases. There's new cases being reported, but what we really need to know is how many of these cases were between households after lockdown because we can handle cases that happen between households before lockdown. Uh, we can handle transmission that happens within households under level four conditions. But if we've got essential workers getting infected and spreading Delta between households under alert level four conditions, then this alert level is actually not working and we may have continuing cases for weeks to come. It's simply not good enough that the government can't level with New Zealand and give us the full data. We can't believe for a moment that when they make a decision to put us under lockdown for another two weeks, they don't have the data, and yet they simply don't seem to want to share it. One thing that might help a little bit is that we've had a victory of sorts, that Parliament will go ahead in person the way it always should. The Prime Minister thinks we should do it over Zoom. We say that the people deserve a proper parliament with the people they elected asking the questions on their behalf, not just one question at a time, as the Prime Minister gives journalists in the press conference every day, but actually a series of questions aiming to get to the truth. And that's what we'll be doing tomorrow. It's interesting, you know, she says that you have to only expect people to do things that you're willing to do yourself. Well, the interesting thing is she doesn't do her press conferences on Zoom. She said that she doesn't want to bring staff into Parliament. Only one staff member has to come into Parliament, which will only have 12 MPs, and almost none of them will actually have to fly or travel. I'm double vaccinated, tested, and been here for the last couple of weeks. What's really interesting is that she doesn't want to have the Epidemic Response Committee reinstated over Zoom. We've got a Prime Minister who will do almost anything 
to avoid accountability. And it's a great shame because we need democratic scrutiny at this time more than ever. And the people that were elected by the citizens that actually pay the bills have a right to see their representatives in Parliament asking questions on the same terms as the Prime Minister runs her office and has her press conferences, that is in person. So we're really looking forward to Parliament happening tomorrow, and we think it's a major win for democracy and for the rights of New Zealanders up and down the country. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a specific area um, of policy, and I'm bringing on uh, one of ACT's uh, MPs who's a real rising star, and that is Karen Shua. Karen is most known for the incredibly brave telling of her own story, Growing up as a SIPS, or was it SIFS, now Oranga Tamariki, she was a kid who was in the care of that organisation. And as she'll tell you, the only thing that's really changed over that time is the letterhead. She's also ex-welfare spokesperson, and she's been hearing from a huge number of people uh, who have been affected by COVID, affected, had their cash flow affected, as we mentioned earlier, and they're finding it's harder to navigate the support systems the government's put in place this time. And this is not just people who are getting a benefit normally. This is a much wider range of people who are, for example, running small businesses. Karen has come to Parliament determined to change the system that she experienced. She's got to be one of the most brave MPs I've ever seen for the speeches that she's given, opening up about her experiences. We're really thrilled to have her in Parliament. She's joining us today uh, from her home on the North Shore of Auckland. Welcome, Karen, to ACT TV. Great to see you. Hey, David. How's things going? Oh, well, you know, apart from <laughs> everything else and the pandemic and all that stuff, things are fabulous. Um, so, um, tell me, um, you're, you're an MP. A lot of people come to you. A lot of people see you as someone who can help navigate the system. Um, what have you been hearing from people getting in touch, not just in, in your immediate community, but up and down New Zealand, um, over the past uh, a few weeks of this lockdown? Yeah, so, you know, lockdown's one thing, but the real world still goes on in the background. And, and there's a lot of businesses that have had to shut their doors. And, and a lot of these are small businesses that, that take care of just a limited amount of people, but they feel the burden of having to support more than just themselves, but but the families that come with, with who they've employed. And they're finding that the system this time round um, is way harder to get this wage subsidy that's that's been spoken about. So um, Inland Revenue is, is needing self-employed people, for one, to, to verify they're self-employed. Now, we've had a year to, to get this sorted before another lockdown happened. And if that was a huge concern to Inland Revenue, then this should have been done way before now so that if a lockdown did happen like it has um wage subsidies could have automatically kicked in so people are waiting up to a week and still not hearing anything and when they're trying to get advice they're getting flicked between msd and inland revenue and don't seem to be getting anywhere it seems to be this never-ending loop it's causing major stress and major panic and i think it's just so unnecessary that we should have planned for that so we've talked a bit about the um I guess, lack of preparation on the public health and epidemiological side when it comes to vaccination, we've talked about a lot, testing, we've talked about tracing, we've talked about contact tracing, um, and the lack of wastewater testing, and so it goes on. But what you're hearing in the areas of policy that you look after for ACT, that actually the preparation to roll out a much tighter wage subsidy, because some people would say that it was a bit loose last time, even if people were happy to get the money, um, really hasn't been done, and they weren't prepared to put in place the checks and balances that they've tried to impose. Yes, and in doing so, they're leaving a lot of people without any any um, stability and any um, security in knowing what tomorrow is going to bring. And I, I think that that's a huge concern uh, on, on top of not having the money. It's also how am I going to keep my business running till next week? How am I going to keep my staff and their families fed? And I think that's the main concern. They're not so worried about themselves. They're worried about their staff and, and the families that need to put food on the table. Yeah, I think it's so critical that you know you're you're here in Parliament reflecting that because if there's one criticism of the government's response, or well, actually there's a lot, but uh, you know in our COVID 2.0 plan we pointed out that the government should be taking an approach 
of overall welfare, or as the government likes to say, well-being. But sometimes in this rush to manage the public health situation, uh, a lot of the other costs and stresses that are put on people uh, don't get heard. Um, what, what's some of the best advice you, you've been able to give people who are having difficulty navigating um, this wage subsidy and, and business support system? Yeah, so the wage subsidy just seems to be a, a web that, that nobody seems to be able to get through. So I, I've been trying my best to try and figure it out myself. And and if I can't figure it out with the resources behind me helping, um, how is the average person supposed to work this out? The MSD site should be more straightforward and also the communication should be a lot better. So um, I'm, I'm making the effort to, to get in there and, and try and speed up the process for people, but I, I seem to be getting as blocked as much as them. Yeah. Can we just change gear a little bit to um, another area of policy, uh, another portfolio that, that you're looking after on behalf of ACT, um, and that is children, or specifically the operation of Oranga Tamariki, the, the organisation that is supposed to help kids um, when they're not getting the support that they should get to have the necessaries of life from their natural family for, for whatever reason. Um, you know, you, you came into Parliament determined to change this. Uh, you've made a good running start. But it seems to me, as you said, that, you know, the only thing that's really changed since the system was trying to support you 30 years ago is actually the, the letterhead on the organisation and maybe the name of it. Uh, the rest of it stayed largely the same. Um, I, I wonder... Um, you know, what have you sort of learned so far about Oranga Tamariki and what is it fundamentally that, that needs to change so we don't just continually hear bad news about Oranga Tamariki? So we've had lots of reforms over the years and we've had name changes and, and we've had things put in place that seemed like they were going to be the miracle cure at the time. Um, right down to back in the day when uh, when we came to an agreement with um, Māoris around FGCs and those were going to be the saviour of, of our Family Māori. group conferences. Yeah, family group conferences. And that was meant to be this big change that was going to fix everything. But it seems like unless we are going to... Um, incorporate the system evenly across the board uh, and, and listen to our children's voices, nothing will ever change. The system takes over and the bureaucratical nonsense that comes with it um, just overrides what's in the best interest of the kids. Uh, and I, I think that's a huge issue. We're not listening to the children and what the children need. We are we are looking at children based on the colour of their skin as a welfare issue, and culture within a household should be more important than than culture. Um, so children need love, care, good education, yeah. food in their tummy, and a kiss on the on the cheek and a good night and knowing that they're safe. And I think the bureaucratical nonsense that's gone on for the last few years has taken over what's in their best interest. You know, what, what you say makes so much sense, um, but somehow the process of Oranga Tamariki and its various ancestors uh, seems to have become more important than the outcome of kids. And I love what you say about the culture in the household is more important than which culture are kids in more widely. Because as you say, those things that a kid needs food in their tummy and a kiss goodnight, um, are actually universal human needs. We're almost pretending that there are totally different types of humans in New Zealand, and that's more important than universal humanity. There was one thing I wanted to ask you about, which was the um, situation with a court case recently where allegedly uh, Sawira Gardner and some senior judges um, tampered with or somehow got involved with trying to influence a judge while that judge was sitting on a case. Um, can, can, you, can you talk us through that? Because at, at one level, it, it sounds outrageous. You know, people shouldn't be interfering with judges. I mean, that's sort of, you know, South American stuff, um, not this thing you need in the, in the least corrupt country on earth, supposedly. Uh, but also, what was the substance of it? I mean, what was the issue? Why were they trying to influence that judge or allegedly trying to influence that judge? So there's a court case going on at the moment and, and the beginning of that court case was in regards to to a foster child that had been in the care of a Pākehā family and um, 
this child had been in their care for what I understand to be three years. And um, a social worker has come in and decided that um, this child's cultural needs were not being met and, and that could lead to harm later in life. And, and they felt like this, uh, that this was, they classed it as some kind of abuse on the child as not meeting their cultural needs. So um, the family had no idea this was happening and, and reports were being written behind the scenes. And as, and as far as they were concerned with their checkups and their, uh, they were doing a great job. The child was developing well, the child was happy and loved and cared for. And all of a sudden they're being faced with an uplift because um, they can't meet this child's cultural needs. In the process, uh, they've taken um, OT to court um, the family courts um, in regards to this to try and keep the custody of this child. In that process, OT workers or social workers were um, interviewed by the judge and um, pretty harsh questions were asked and, and those questions obviously didn't make some people very happy and behind the scenes, by the sounds of it, we've had the head of OT and two senior judges um, voice their concerns to this judge while the case was still ongoing. So, so it's a huge concern. One, how is not meeting cultural needs a form of abuse? Um, there are many families raising children that are of different cultures to them. It doesn't mean they love them any less. And two, we should separate the political system and the judicial system. There should be no crossover, and that's a line that should never be crossed in this country. We need to be know that people can be held accountable for bad behaviour, even if it is within a government department. Well, look, um, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with anything you've just said. It's extremely well put. Can I just finish before we, we go to questions um, that people are firing through at quite a rate now? Um, you know, you, you, you're saying... Um, that we need, uh, you know, to, to change the, the culture perhaps within Oranga Tamariki more than anything. Uh, and I know you've got a, a private member's bill that you need to get drawn out of the lottery, which is a crazy way to make laws, but that's how some of New Zealand's most important laws have started. Um, talk people through what, what would your private member's bill do and how would that change the culture of Oranga Tamariki um, so that Oranga Tamariki is focused on the culture in the household rather than culture in the wider sense determining what abuse is. Yeah, so as a Māori myself and going through the system, um, I understand that there are some children that live within certain cultural um, households and, and that deserves to be um, seen through to their care. But there's also children that have never been part of that culture and, and um, being seen through into that care may not necessarily be the be all and end all of a happy outcome. And Section 7AA in the Oranga Tamariki Act basically is a law just for Māori children. And it's about Māori children not being raised outside of their culture. So uh, my question is, is we already have enough trouble finding loving families for these children. Um, how are we supposed to get caregivers to put their hands up to take on these children and love and care for them if they don't have the, st the stability of knowing that um, they can and a forever home is really a forever home and we're not going to end up with more reverse uplifts. So just to make it clear, we, we tell kids that their home is forever and then for basically political reasons, they can get reverse uplifted from that home and put somewhere else because the government has judged that it's more important to carry out a, a kind of cultural um, imposition that, than it is to, to have that kid, that own kids be be happier. Is that, I mean, yes. So, I mean, sure I, I, right? people I, will be stung by this. Yes, so I've had um, personal experience with, with someone close to me that has been through this, and it's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, watching a child that's, that's, too scared to be hugged and finally getting to the point where they have confidence in themselves and they start to love themselves. And then someone comes along and says, because you're not the same colour as this child, you, you can't raise them appropriately. And, and it's heartbreaking for the parents that have, that have put all their love and care into these kids. And it's also damaging for the child that's developed a relationship with these people. And they already have problems with feeling abandoned and now they're going to get abandoned again and it's not going to be explained to them. Well, Karen, I'm just so proud that Act brought you into Parliament, and um, I think if you can't fix OT, uh, then I'm not sure that that anyone can. Now, I'm I'm getting a bit of a hurry up 
uh, from the producers of ACT TV saying, we've got to go to the questions. Um, so we've got a, a number of questions that have been um, sent through. Uh, Haley asks, how has, uh, and this, uh, I don't know if you, you might have heard from people on this, on this level in the welfare portfolio, Karen, um, Haley asks, how has lockdown impacted families and particularly women in violent situations? Yes, yeah, so I asked Carmel Cipollone about this um, in Select Committee last week. Um, what are we doing to um, let women know that even if they're in a dangerous situation, that they can leave, they can get out, and there are places still running? Um, they said they've advertised it on um, Facebook and other social media platforms, but I'm hearing that women are still staying in these situations because they feel like um, they want to do the right thing and don't want to breach their bubble. But um, what I want to say is you deserve to be in a safe place. And if that is the only way you can be safe, please breach your bubble and please look for help. Um, these situations cause a lot of stress. Um, families on low income, uh, families stressing about how they're going to pay their bills next week. A and tempers can flare. And if you need to find a way out, please ring someone. Yeah, no, well, it's it's great advice, and it is you know a, a specific group of people that we've really got to think of. It's one of the many other costs um, of of lockdowns, and that's why the, fundamentally we've got to move to a strategy that doesn't rely on them. Um, I, I, I want to um, go to um, Alison, who says, "Are you concerned the government is not doing enough for vulnerable children during COVID nineteen, Karen? That, that's um, something you touched on briefly. I, I don't know if you have more to add on that." Yeah, so I mean, last time round, they stopped the welfare checks and they stopped the investigations while lockdown was in place, from what I could tell. Um, hopefully this time round, they are continuing with the investigations of concern. Last lockdown, the reports of concern dropped dramatically. And this was, this was a concern to me because it goes to show that schools and daycares and, and places our children go apart from home, are the safe haven and they're where people see that there's a concern and they'll report it. So with all our children sitting in, in homes that aren't as safe as they should be, there's no one there to kind of report it. So uh, we're relying on the public if they see or hear anything to please still let OT know what's going on because um, they do have a 24 hour number and, and we're relying on the public to help with, with these vulnerable kids. Yeah, and uh, Sebastian asks, do you believe that beneficiaries should be forced to get the COVID-19 jab uh, to keep their benefit? Look, I, <coughs> I, I don't believe that. I, I think generally um, it should be one of the requirements of getting benefits to do a bunch of things. It's not free money. You know, the most obvious thing is you should be looking for work. Um, I think that with other long-established vaccinations, uh, such as MMR, I think if people aren't prepared to do those basic health things for their kids, um, then there's a real question over whether or not the taxpayer should keep uh, giving them money. When it comes to this uh, COVID-19 vaccination, you know, I've had it, I believe that it's safe. I think the evidence that it's safe is overwhelming. And when you dig into some of the people saying it isn't, um, you find there's actually not a lot there. Um, but nevertheless, you know, would we advocate that as a policy right now? Um, probably not. Um, I think that it just, you know, the issue the government has right now is they don't have enough vaccines. They're not short of people. Uh, they're short of actual doses, and that's where the real focus should be. But, uh, of course, you know, people should want to protect themselves uh, from getting hospitalised and especially dying. And um, I believe at some point, uh, New Zealand is going to have to reconnect with the world and the chance of catching Delta may become much higher. Uh, and if that's the case, then it's going to be really important to, to be vaccinated. It will make you a lot safer. I think it's something people should want to do anyway. Um, when it comes to um, the next question, uh, Damien says, how would you measure success with poverty? Um, look, I, I could give you a, a, an answer for that, but I'm guessing, uh, Karen, you might have a a much better one. So let me let, let me turn it over to you. How would you measure success with poverty? I, I think success with poverty, poverty is a lot of things. And I think that's the issue that this government has is they don't actually understand that money is not the only thing that fixes poverty. Poverty is a mindset as well. And success for me is seeing people that are in poverty 
actually believing that they can be better and they can get out of that rut that they're stuck in. And I think the success with poverty would be people's mentalities changing and changing their, their faith in themselves. And that, to me, would be a success in poverty. And uh, we've got a, a question here from Karina. Um, what's happening with people who rely on schools to feed kids? Um, what happens with food grants if your kids can't go to school and they were being fed allegedly by, by free school lunches? Um, mm. What happens there? Um, I don't know if that's a, an issue that you will have come across directly, but it is really interesting that people um, you know, have got to the stage where it's a school's job um, mm. to feed kids. Uh, a lot of schools have actually rejected that because they see it as actually corrosive of people's values. Um, what do you make of, of the school lunch program, Karen? So, I mean, I think if they're going to do a school lunch program, they should have rolled it out to all schools. So what's good for some children is good for all children and make it universal. Um, I think a lot of families um, will start to rely on that. And when we have a situation that's like it's happening now, a lockdown, um, they're unable to um, afford or budget for feeding their children. And, and they're applying for help now um, with MSD. And a lot of them are finding that they've been denied that help and sent to get food grants from um, food banks and places like that. And my only concern is we've shut down butcheries and we've shut down um, grocery stores, uh, uh, sorry, veggie stores, but we've got all these food banks that are open that MSD is sending them to, and and I, I just think wouldn't it be better to to put those food grants onto onto their green card, allow them to go to the supermarket, buy what they need for their kids right now, and and lower the risk of, of how many people they're coming into contact with. Um, so these food banks are pretty much the same danger as the butcheries and the um, bakeries, but they're having to open because of the desperation of families that just can't feed their kids right now. Um, and also, if they can go to a supermarket with their green card, they can buy what, what is good for them and what suits where they're living. Because a lot of people in these MSD motels don't actually have the cooking facilities to deal with the food they've been given from the food banks. I mean, that's, that's an extraordinary situation. The government's banned butchers and greengrocers from operating. Uh, and they're now being replaced by food banks while the butchers and greengrocers uh, go broke. Um, look, we're, we're just about out of time, but I just want to finish. Uh, people are often curious about what X overall welfare policy is. Um, can you just talk us through um, electronic in income management and, and where we apply that as, as ACT policy? Yeah, so one of our policies is, is making sure that the money goes to where it's needed. And, and, and our children are very vulnerable and they don't have a choice where that money goes. So if you are um, on a benefit and you've got children and, and you've been on that benefit for a long time um, and you're doing everything right, you, you'll be left to your own devices, you know, you're doing everything okay. But if you, you go and have another child on that benefit, then you won't just automatically get extra money for the next child. Uh, we'll do what's called electronic welfare, where you'll still get the help, it's still there, but everything you purchase will be monitored, so we're making sure that the children are getting what they need. Well, th thanks, Darren. On our, um, on our benefits as well. So you could... It, we have people that sit on lifetime benefits, and this creates generational welfare. People that get used to it, that a benefit's just going to keep coming in. So we'll have a time limit on, on how long you can sit on a job seeker benefit before we, we implement the electronic welfare. And, and, but we're also, instead of just taking away something, we'll be provide, want to provide you with the wraparound services to help you succeed and become better. So fundamentally, we're, we're using technology to get more support on people that are, are chronically on welfare and try and get them off instead of just giving them more cash. Um, look, th this is, I think, the, the best balance of a compassionate um, but also hopeful uh, welfare policy, and I'm, I'm really proud that the next promoting it. Um, look, Karen, we're, we're all out of time. Thank you for coming on, um, and I think people can see there's a lot of questions when it went from one MP to 10, you know, what's, what are these people going to be like? Um, if you can't back Karen, then it's going to be pretty hard to back anyone in Parliament. Uh, she is knowledgeable, compassionate, articulate, 
and uh, she's got her heart in exactly the right place. She's the kind of person we need in the next government uh, to drive change and actually solve some of the very real social problems uh, that this government has left us with. In fact, successive governments have left us with. So thank you again, Karen. Um, and that's all uh, from ACT TV tonight. Uh, we're going to have uh, ACT TV uh, every night uh, this week. And tomorrow night, um, we're very pleased to announce that we're going to have Professor Des Gorman to talk about the big picture in relation to COVID-19. Uh, what are the options that an uh, island nation of 5 million people face uh, with Delta breathing down our necks, literally? And what are the prospects of getting through the next few weeks? What technologies and policies should New Zealand be adopting uh, to actually safely reconnect with the rest of the world. Uh, we hope that you'll join us for that discussion. Uh, we need more debate. We need more voices. We need honest conversations about the future of this country. That's what ACT strives to deliver, and we're really grateful for people who have tuned in to ACT TV. Until then, we'll see, good night, and we'll see you tomorrow.